Welcome to another edition of Focal Point. My name is Chris DeBoer and I serve as the Executive Director of the Forum Perspective Foundation. There are many challenges to Christian freedom facing the church today. And one of the most pressing issues in Canada is the federal government's desire to ban what is called conversion therapy. However, in many municipalities, especially in Alberta, bylaws have been passed outlawing conversion therapy within city limits. The reason why this conversion therapy ban is so concerning to Christians and to the church is that the definition of conversion therapy is so broadly defined so as to make it almost impossible for any Christian struggling with same-sex attraction to get pastoral help or counseling. So there would be good reason to engage in a discussion about all of the political implications of the federal government's Bill C-6, formerly Bill C-8, and perhaps that can be done at a future date. What I want to focus on today is what should be meant by proper conversion therapy from a Christian perspective, or rather, how should brothers and sisters in Christ serve the needs of fellow Christians who are struggling with same-sex attraction? How should we understand same-sex attraction? And we also want to explore how has Christendom, in the broad sense, responded to this issue. So joining me today to explore these and other issues is the Executive Director of Faith Beyond Belief, Jojo Ruba. Faith Beyond Belief exists to help Christians become effective ambassadors for Christ in everyday conversations. They want to help Christians share the truth of the Christian faith with compassion, but without compromise, and in ways ordinary people can understand. They are engaged in training Christians through conferences, presentations at churches and schools, and offering a number of courses, such as their Worldview course, training Christians to be faithful ambassadors of their king. Now, Jojo and I made a number of joint presentations together earlier this year in Alberta, and we spoke about the necessity of good training, especially for our young people, for the world in which they live, an increasingly hostile world against the Christian worldview. It's our hope that today's conversation will help Christians of all ages not only be ambassadors of Christ outside the church, but specifically to be godly brothers and sisters to each other within the church. Jojo Ruba has been diligent in his efforts across Alberta to prevent the banning of conversion therapy bylaws from passing. He has attended numerous city council meetings across the province, and most recently in his current resident city, Calgary. Recently, Jojo explained that one of the reasons for his passion on this issue, in addition to his love for our Heavenly Father, has been the blessing that pastoral love, help, and counseling has been to him as he struggled with same-sex attraction. And he firmly believes that all Christians ought to have these opportunities open to them. Jojo, thanks for joining me today. Glad to be here, Chris. So, Giorgio, as we get started, before we discuss your, your personal journey and, and challenges with same-sex attraction, I wonder if we could start by getting an understanding of what is meant by um, the concepts of homosexuality, of same-sex attraction, and same-sex intimacy. Well, uh, yeah, it's, it's good to start there because labels are very important in this discussion. And there are many uh, different ways we can get caught if we don't understand foundational ideas. So when we talk about someone who is gay or homosexual or homosexuality, uh, there's at least four things we could be talking about. So that could refer to the person who experiences these kinds of attractions. That can refer to the behavior these persons uh, engage in. That can refer to the um, uh, actions themselves. Uh, so that's sorry, the, the attractions themselves. So what they're attracted to. And it can also refer to an identity that we've created, that we've embraced, 
to define ourselves based on our sexuality or sexual attractions. And that's important too, because um, the, the concept of homosexual identity and heterosexual identity is in fact quite new. It's only about 150 years old. And what I mean by that is that homosexual practices existed in the past. Uh, we, we read about that obviously in the Bible, but in ancient Roman times, a man who was a fairly wealthy man uh, could uh, have sex with anyone in his house, you know, woman, man, slave, uh, his wife, his kids, and no one would look down on that. That was his right as the, the man to do that. And uh, no one would label him through his sexual practices. It's only a modern concept that we've taken the word homosexuality and heterosexuality to create it as an identity uh, that defines who you are. In fact, prior to the 1860s, uh, if you, uh, you, you do look up the word heterosexual, it actually referred to people who were promiscuous with the same sex. It wasn't actually referring to people who were straight or only attracted to the opposite sex. Um, and I, I meant opposite sex, that, that's what I was trying to say. So the, the identity of homosexuality and heterosexuality was created in the 1860s uh, around the time of Germany when they were trying to fight, when LGBT activists were trying to fight laws against homosexual practice. So they coined these terms as a way to, to show that they were equivalent, that there are both natural homosexual and heterosexual identities that defined us. And what's happened since then is broad-based, we have embraced these identities to define ourselves. Um, one of the points I like to make, Chris, is that it's like asking a fish to describe what it's like to live in water. The fish won't be able to, to know what that's like because that's what it always has. We live in a culture that's always defined ourselves now by our sexual attractions. And what history shows us is that's actually a fairly new concept. So just to go back to scripture quickly here, when the Bible uses the word heterosexual or, hom or homosexual, I'm sorry, homosexuality, what what people who are called revisionists are trying to do is say, well, the word homosexual wasn't in the Bible. Revisionists are people who want to take teachings on the Bible and revise it to make it what they want it to mean. So that could be true of hell, that could be true of the deity of Jesus, but in this case, it's, it's what they're trying to do on, on sexuality. So they're right that the word homosexual doesn't appear in the Old Testament, the New Testament, because it wasn't coined until the 1860s. But the practice of homosexuality is clearly described. So in Leviticus 18, for example, they, the, the text there says, you shall not lie with a man as if with a woman. And, and so you, you don't have to use the phrase homosexual to know what that means. And then Paul actually takes that phrase about lie, man lying with a man as if with a woman, and that's the phrase he uses in, in Romans and in Corinthians. So he's, he's referencing this same practice that was banned in the Old Testament. So the word homosexual doesn't have to be in the Bible for the description of the practice to take to be condemned. And, and I think this is where if you don't know your worldview, you don't know your Bible, uh, you, it'll be easy to get trapped in this. And I can tell your audience that uh, you know, there are reformed churches that have gone liberal on these issues. And I use the word liberal in the sense of revisionist uh, because they've bought into this identity politics. So they've bought into this identity uh, concept of sexuality. And then they read into what the Bible says. So rather than uh, same-sex sexual practices, what they read into that is it's actually uh, pedophilia. It's actually um, ch uh, prostitution that the, the Bible is referring to. When in fact, clearly the practice is if you treat a man, if you're a man, if you treat another man's body sexually like you would a woman, that is what's uh, uh, banned or that is what is uh, taught against in scripture. So this idea of finding one's identity in our sexuality mm -hmm. as, as a way for the uh, German uh, activists in those days then to to try and make um, an equality between heterosexual practice and homosexual practice mm -hmm. well clearly it was effective um, right they, they managed to convince many millions billions of people that our sexuality is at, at least very core to our identity uh, who am I I am 
you know, Chris, uh, Christian, uh, heterosexual, like it seems to be uh, core. Uh, do you know how people would have identified themselves prior to the sexual revolution? What, what were identifying um, qualifiers prior to our sexuality or in addition? Yeah, yeah no, that, that's, that's a good question. What's interesting, there's a website called the art of manliness which is a pretty funny website it talks about what you need to do as a man it gives like dress tips and you know how to as fix your shoes make sure they don't look scuffed that kind of stuff but they also do some other thoughtful things so they actually had a photo essay um of men posing with their friends maybe their brothers in in the past uh and they took these black and white photos and they they showed them and you could see these men pose in very intimate ways where they're sitting in each other's lap or they're looking into each other's eyes, they're holding hands. And, and what's interesting is there's no concept or thought that these people are, are gay. That there's a natural intimacy that was celebrated before this term of sexual identity became widespread. And places like India and Africa, the men still walk down the street holding hands. And no one thinks that they're they're gay. They're just being they're friendly with each other. They're they're friends, and so uh, prior to this time period, uh, there was a sense that um, you could be identified with your culture or your race or your class. That was a huge one. Your economic class, right. but no one thought of defining themselves the way we do it now through who you want to sleep with, or who you're sexually attracted to. Uh, there there was definitely people who who might have geared towards that or who who wrote or thought about that more sure. but they were they were not confined into a sexual category so what's happened now chris is that this this next generation actually i think is is uh, realizing this or at least exhibiting it so uh, the, the, the by the way the terms or what i'm talking about with the, the um, heterosexual and homosexual as a societal construct or social construct is what we call it, where it's only been created recently. This is LGBT activists and historians telling us this. This is not Christians writing this stuff. This is them acknowledging these identities are, are ones that we have created to describe ourselves, but they don't have to be real in our life in terms of they don't have to define you. And Vice Magazine, a very liberal, magazine, very progressive magazine. Um, and I, I have to say, I don't like that word progressive because it's not really progress what they teach, but it, it's, that's the term they use. Uh, they've discovered that this next generation don't actually like those labels either. So in one recent study that they had, uh, they found that only 48% of Generation Z, so these are late teens, 16 to 21 or so, identify as heterosexual. The other percentages identify as all kinds of things. Uh, and there's, there's the terms like pansexual, where you can be attracted to men, women, and any other, any other group of people. There's also ways you can identify with your emotional attraction versus your sexual attraction. Uh, there's obviously transgenderism as an identity. That's a whole different category. But now, how do you define yourself? So there's been articles uh, in the transgender community that talk about how someone who, who's male who transitions to a female body but still considers himself a lesbian mm -hmm. that, that that's that's what's going on with the gender identity and sexuality like and, and then, then there's others who argue who's still biologically male but identify as female and want to date males Do, does that does mm -hmm. that make him gay or straight or like these are the the kinds of confusing things that happen when sexuality or gender identity become your identity, like it, it defines you. So uh, it, it's, it's really become so widespread, we don't remember, like your question asked, uh, was asked, what it was like before. And what was like before was people still had sex in all kinds of ways, people still behaved in all kinds of ways, but they never used it to define themselves permanently as an immutable, unchanging identity as they do today. Well, and that's really interesting because the, the consequence of identifying ourselves through our sexuality seems to have an impact on all of our relationships, um, also our same-sex relationships. You know, I, I think, uh, for example, my best friend growing up, you don't want to 
do anything that might perceive be perceived as being gay, as it were. So that former intimacy of of friends of the same gender, we we may have lost that now to a degree because we're afraid that it is quote unquote gay. Um, so there's a yep. Yeah. I was going to say there's a, a Christian blogger. Uh, she was writing about uh, a phone call conversation she had with her best friend, who's also a mom, in the car, and her 13-year-old daughter is on the passenger seat. And when they, as they finish up their conversation, she says to her best friend, I love you so much. Uh, we'll talk later. I can't wait to get together with you again. And as she hangs up, her 13-year-old daughter sitting beside her says, Mom, you, that was so gay. Mm. Because it was uh, intimate with someone of the same sex. Now, the fact that it was intimate, and, and when I use that word and our first reaction is must be sexual intimacy, shows us how corrupted our understanding of intimacy is. That we, we don't have a sense of natural same sex intimacy that's normal, that's actually God given. Uh, and, and so I, I, I think especially this is the case for men. We in our a culture in the West don't have uh, avenues where we can have male intimacy that isn't seen as sexual. So uh, going back to that um, Art of Manliness uh, website, if you follow the photo essay, it actually has a picture of a men's basketball team just around the turn of the century, about 1900 or so. And in that, in, in that imagery, the men are standing uh, to the side, they're looking um, to their rights, but they're standing to the side where their chest and back are touching each other and they're all in a row. And, and it's, it's one of those images that you think, wow, that's something a men's basketball team would never post that. And, 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 and that's in fact what happened less than 40 years later in around 1942, a, a similar men's basketball team, and it's like Stanford or one of these universities, has the image that we are used to today where the men are not touching each other, they're looking forward, they're, they're beside each other, but their knees don't touch kind of thing. And, and I think that's very symbolic of what's happened here. So uh, this, this need, and, and C.S. Lewis talks about this very well, that God designed us to have four at least love needs, right? Eros is romantic love. Um, uh, storge is family love. Uh, obviously agape is, is God love, unconditional love. And then uh, uh, philia is friendship love. And if we think through what the, even the Bible shows us, even Jesus had intimate, close friendships with other men. And, and not, obviously it wasn't sexual, but we have to recognize that that shows that if Jesus himself had that need for same-sex friends that were intimate, that were close as a man, then clearly we shouldn't be ashamed of the fact that we do too. But there is something emasculating about being labeled gay. Right. You have your mannerisms or your, your, the way you speak, the way you act, and no man wants to be labeled that way. In fact, even in the gay community, Chris, that's exactly what they struggle with. So if you go through gay literature, and, and I'm reading a book now actually on gay pornography, and one of the things the book says, and it's, it's a history of, it doesn't have gay porn, it's just the history yeah. of gay porn, just to clarify. Yeah. And one of the things it says there is there's an obsession with the heterosexual male. And there's actually gay porn sites specifically just to, um, to look at uh, or, or to be, because you're attracted to what's called straight acting men. And so there, there, there's, there's an obsession with intimacy there with people of the same sex. And, and I think the reason why that is, is because there's a natural need for that. So when I talk about homosexuality, what I talk about is same sex sexual attraction, when you've sexualized that need. One of the points I'm trying to make in my, my resources, I'm actually putting a book together on this. So hopefully it'll be something that your community can, can hear and listen to. And that these are things I think have been very helpful in the ministry side of things when we talk to people, is that we think of homosexuality, if you've never experienced, if you've never experienced same-sex attraction, as merely being sexually attracted to someone of the same body, the way you're attracted to someone of the opposite set of body. And we just assume it's the same thing. It's not. What ends up happening with the person who experiences same-sex attraction is the person somehow perceives someone of the same sex 
as someone who is different. And it's that sense of difference, that sense of, of not belonging to the masculine in, in my case or in the male case that allows for that attraction to happen in the first place. Like in nature, we, we recognize that sexuality, by very definition, God designed sexuality to bring together a male and female. That's why it's called re sexual reproduction. It's not, a, it's not a, asexual reproduction where you know, a, a cell divides by itself, right? The, the highest form, by the way, of any kind of animal that produces asexually, or there's a kind of lizard that does it. And it's because it's, they, they live so far apart from each other, they, they often can't find other members of their species to mate. But that's the highest they can go in terms of development. Um, God designed most animals and, and many plants to be able to reproduce sexually because it allows for genetic differentiation. And the way they do that, what God does that is they, he, he, it, uh, they rely on sexual attraction. So the male is attracted to the female or the female is attracted to the male and they come together. That's how they reproduce. That's why peacocks have giant tails and peahens don't. But the peahens look at the giant tail as part of the attraction. There's, many of your people would probably be familiar with this, but uh, the reason why a lot of goats stink, a lot of those species of goats particularly, is because the male has produces a kind of hormone in his urine and he urinates on himself. Right. And then the female is attracted to that hormone. So I always ask the kids, which is worse? The guys who have to pee on themselves or the girls who are attracted to it, right? <laughs> so in nature, we see that there's a natural attraction for the difference. So what happens in homosexual attraction is that for some reason, the person experiencing it somehow thinks he or she is different from who they're attracted to. So that opposite sex attraction still exists in the person's brain, but somehow they think, or they presume, or they feel, and they, don't, they may not even think about it. This is just something they feel, that the person they're attracted to is different from them. And this can take all kinds of forms, right? And you see this in the gay community where there's a huge age gap and they're, they're trying to fulfill sort of a father-son role. It could be something like race. You're attracted to someone of a different race because you perceive them as different. And, and this is a key part of how we need to help people who struggle with this. Um, you, you know, there's a natural as well, unattraction or, or discomfort, or even let's just say it's icky, it's gross to think of having sex with someone of the same sex, right? And, and I think that's natural. That's how God designed it because it's not supposed to happen. And, and so someone who experienced the same sex attraction doesn't have that sense of ickiness because they somehow perceive the person they're attracted to is opposite them. And if you recognize that, then you recognize what's, what's actually the problem, Chris, is how they view themselves. And as the church, this is where we can really step in and help because at the end of the day, it's our job to be community. It's our job to share community with people and help them know we, we can identify with Christ. And not only, not only that, we're all the same. The Bible is very clear. There's no temptation. That's not uncommon. We all face the same kind of humanity. And the reason why this is, frankly, becoming more and more powerful in our culture, Chris, and, and I think the church needs to recognize this, because more and more young people are feeling lonely and disconnected from community. And so it's a lot easier to think, I'm different from the other boys, or I'm different from the other girls. And I would challenge you, almost every coming out video that I've seen on YouTube includes the phrase, I never felt like I was the, like the other boys, or I never felt like I was the, like the other girls. Right. And, and that's what we're dealing with here. So there's a sense, uh, I think what we've done wrong in the past is we've tried to fix the attraction when really what needs to be dealt with is how a person feels about themselves. You know, there's a lot in there, you know. You know, I know just, I'm sorry, I went on a little bit. <laughs> no, but you, you have the, I think when you end off with the challenge of the loneliness in, in this super hyped up social media world, Right. I mean, I think that's another topic for another day, really. If we if we talk about how do we help our kids right. in this very um, nonstop social media uh, world, which has huge consequences, uh, maybe including then this this feeling of being different, not only uh, different from females biologically and sexually, but also then different from other males. 
right. and which may contribute then to this attraction to that which is different and yet of the same sexuality. Interesting, um, uh, interesting connections there. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess my, my next question has to do with this, this uh, translating then of same sex attraction and difference. So God created male and female, so he created the difference. Right and, and made it so that we would um, uh, experience the joy of our difference. Actually, right. um, but then people who are who are attracted sexually to somebody of the same uh, sexual uh, gender, they are mistranslating, or they are they seem to be misinterpreting uh, the difference there somehow. And and then how do we help them yeah grapple with that like is well maybe we can start with is that same sex sexual attraction as you call it a result of sin uh, is it sin and and how do how are how are these um brothers and sisters in christ how should they view themselves then if, if the problem is how they view themselves how should they view themselves? So you know, two or three issues, I guess, kind of coddled there. Yeah, well, that's my fault for bringing two or three issues up in my, my comments. Well, let, let's go back, back a little bit. When C.S. Lewis talks about these four love needs that we have, right? Brotherly love, family love, friendship love, um, romantic love, agape love. Um, we, we, he actually says something very key here that we, we don't recognize anymore because our culture says love is love, it conflates, it brings all of those loves as if they're the same. Right. And that's not the case. Uh, each of these loves, he says, meet different unique needs and they're not interchangeable. That's really important. Yes. In fact, we know this when we look at any psychology textbook or any parenting advice. And, and if you've read them, you'll, you'll see that almost everyone universally says, especially if you have underage children, you should never be your child's best friend. Why? Because as a parent, if, if, if you uh, are understanding your role as mom or dad, you have a specific way to love your child that no one else will be able to experience except through you. And, and you have, of course, there's tra tragic situations where people die or people leave, then someone else fulfills that role because we need a father mother role in our life. All of us do. That's why God designed family that way. And, and so if you try to become your child's friend and she's only six years old, uh, that's not the way to raise a child. We all know that. You, you end up creating a tyrant who grows up, who doesn't have any boundaries, right? In the same way, God designed us, I would argue, with same-sex love and needs, just like uh, you had mentioned with David and Jonathan. Uh, Ruth and Naomi were probably very intimate and very close. And again, it wasn't sexual. The, the LGBT community, because they're so confused about this love is love kind of thing, They've actually written things like a Queen James Bible, where they make every character in the Bible gay, except for Judas, right? And and every time they exactly <laughs> that, that's the face wow. I you that's wow. the face, you, you can look it up on on Amazon. But the point is, uh, all of these kinds of activities point to I think the fact that they cannot separate intimacy with sex, right? And so there's a natural longing for, uh, for same-sex intimacy, we all have that. I mean, the iconic image of the little boy who's sitting in the bathroom uh, looking at his dad while his dad is shaving and has shaving cream all over his face, right? Yeah. And what does the little boy do? He asks the dad to shave, to give him shaving cream, and he yeah. does shaving on his face, even though there's nothing on his face yet. Right? What is that image of? It's a little boy imprinting and saying, I'm like dad. Yeah. I, I, my, I, and dad affirms that and says, one day you'll be able to do it as well. Here, let's practice. And for, for women, it's a different kind of thing, right? Maybe it's a conversation they have about the woman as, as a, a young girl. She's, she's wanting to be a mommy someday. And mom says, yeah, no, one day you'll be able to do that just like I have. And there's this, this sense of that. And in fact, and I, I haven't done the study yet, but I think it's true if you look at cultures like uh, traditional or Jewish culture or many African tribes where they still have um, a, a, um, a ceremony where they celebrate a boy or a girl becoming a man or becoming a woman, 
Right. Homosexual rates are very low there because what ends up happening is those boys, those girls end up identifying with their gender identity, their, their biological sex by saying, I'm no different from the people I consider male or masculine, that uh, there's no sexual attraction for that. There's a, there's a natural re revulsion, I would say, for people of the same biological sex in terms of sexual intimacy, but there's still that need for friendship intimacy. And so as the church, that's, that's part of our job is to affirm that. I, 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 here, here's an example that might be helpful for those in ministry. I, I was speaking at a Christian school and a young girl, maybe 13 or 14, came up to me. And she said, uh, I really love my best friend who's a girl. And you could tell she was sort of struggling with what to say. And my response was, great. That's wonderful. What kind of love is that? And she said, that's filial love. And I said, exactly. God designed you to need that and to, to get that from other girls. Isn't that a great thing? And Chris, you should have seen the relief on her face because we, because our culture labels all of these love needs the same way, she was probably struggling with what is this kind of love that I have, this attraction that I have. So back to your question roundabout about attraction, uh, look, lust is a sin. And lust, according to scripture, is when you turn someone else's body and turn them into something that uh, you use for your own sexual pleasure, right? You, you uh, turn them into an object. And, and I think that's, well, obviously Jesus says that's, that's just like having sex and that's just a sinful. Uh, but there's difference between that, I would think, and attraction, because I think there is a healthy attraction. We can experience it even if we don't experience same-sex sexual attraction. When you hear a good speaker, a pastor, or someone who, who's the, the football star or the, the cheerleading star, whoever, there's a natural attraction to them in the sense you like to be their friend. You want to get to know them as a person. And, and I don't think that's, that's wrong. Again, that's natural. God designed us to have that. The problem is when, when you're, you're growing up and you conflate or you, you don't realize that there's something different from that with sexual attraction when you want to be sexually intimate with someone. And, and, and I think too, let, let, let's, let's make it clear because there is some confusion on this. There, sexual attraction is itself not wrong either in the sense of there's a natural attraction between a man and woman. That's how God designed it. Right? That isn't sinful. That's how it should be. Hopefully, as a married, uh, married person, you were attracted to your spouse before you got married. Right? That's part of the reason why you got married, right? Uh, what, what happens though, because the world is fallen, every aspect of our life, including our attractions, are broken. And, and that's why even as a, as a person who may never experience same-sex attraction, uh, if you're married, you could still end up finding yourself attracted to someone of the opposite sex who you're not married to, yeah. right? And, and let me use that as an example, because I think that will help. Is the attraction in that case sinful? Well, I, I don't think so. You, there's a natural, we can look at a beautiful woman and say she's actually really beautiful and not turn that into lust, right? And, and you can recognize that you're getting attracted to someone who you're not married to, but if that attraction becomes fantasy, if that attraction now becomes obsession, that becomes lust and now you're sinning, right? And, and I just talked to a, a guy, he, was, he was shared his story that he was a, at an office job and became and realized he was getting really attracted to a woman that he wasn't married to. And because that attraction was turning into lust, he quit that job and worked somewhere else because he just couldn't control the attraction. But I would say the initial attraction that sparked to say, oh, that person's really interesting. I want to get to know that person. That itself isn't sinful, but it can become sinful. It can become lust. Yeah, and um, to begin, I'm not sure how far apart we are on that point. Mm -hmm. I guess, first of all, I would say there are no stones to throw. Uh, right. When I comment here, um, it's not as, a, as a, an opportunity to throw a stone because when you first speak about, for example, a great speaker, as and being attracted to somebody like that, mm. I'm with you, right? So when I first heard Ravi Zacharias, you know, giving a speech and telling uh, stories at the beginning and putting his whole presentation together, I'm attracted as a male, but I also get everybody else and say, hey guys, check this out. 
right. um, you should be attracted to this good quality speaker. Um, but, you know, if, if I see a, a, another a sister coming into church, a sister in the Lord, and my eyes glance at her, and I'm attracted to her physically, it's not I want to get to know her better. There is, an, there is a, a sense of she's beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, it's not an initial uh, sex uh, or lust in, initially off the hop, but neither is it the same as, oh, you know, brother so-and-so got a haircut. Doesn't that look nice? And it's mm -hmm. not the same as Ravi Zacharias, who's a great speaker. It's, there is a sexual tension, if you will put it there, that is not appropriate. It's not that lust. It's, whoa, Chris, don't look there again, Chris. And, and my intimacy with my wife, you're right, it has only grown. Mm -hmm. We're great. married 15 years. And Congratulations. Yeah, and I love her actually more today than when we got married. And Wonderful. my eyes have, I, I think the blinders actually have, have closed a little tighter so that I only, uh, for the most part, I try, only look at my wife in that, in that attractive way. Mm. But when, when I see a pretty girl, yeah, a pretty woman, uh, that walks past me, my eye does glance and I, I have that momentary attraction, which I think would be a result of my sinful nature, that it's, that there's this, because I don't have it with all women, and there are some women with whom I am friends that I don't have that same attraction, if you will, of course. Yeah. right? So I wonder if, if somebody is struggling with same-sex sexual attraction, I would say to you, brother, are you not, in a sense, using the word attraction in the same way that others are using the word love? So you've warned us to be careful not to use love as love, and they've conflated all four kinds of love. I wonder if you've kind of done that with attraction by using Ravi Zacharias, or no, I used Ravi Zacharias, but using a speaker yes. and, and being attracted to a speaker as, as though it were the same as being attracted to somebody of any gender then um, because of their beauty. I wonder if that's a conflation of those two, of, of attraction. Yeah, no, that's a great question, Chris, and I'm glad you pushed back a little bit on this. I think for someone who experiences same-sex sexual attraction, uh, that's the problem. It's been conflated. So what I'm trying to do is just help people distinguish in their minds uh, that the, there are natural attraction that are not sinful. Right. But be, because you put them all together, what your experiences or my experiences is that we all of those are together part of the way I process, part of how I help understand what I'm going through is to help my understand that there's distinctions in those attractions. There's ones that are helpful, that are good, and there's ones that are not good, that do come from a broken, sinful nature. Right? So the, I, I think you're right in the sense that it's part of our brokenness that we live in a world where we can't trust our sexual attractions because it's, it's been corrupted. Um, but at the same time, I would say the first, when, when the, someone's walking down the street and you notice someone very attractive, the first look isn't sinful. It's the second one that is, when you, when you act on it, right? So when you choose and you say, okay, I, I, if I look over there, there's a very attractive woman, I choose not to look that way because I know that I could fall into lust or that's, that's now acting on that attraction, okay. right? But to, to, sh to that initial spark to say that I'm attracted, I don't think that's sinful. I think that's a natural reaction to something as a, as a man seeing an attractive woman. Um, it's, 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 again, it's the difference between coveting and being hungry or being, uh, or seeing that uh, you're, you're, you have a need. It, it, Jesus, when he was tempted and, uh, by, by Satan, um, and he was told to make stones into bread, yeah. I would argue he had a natural reaction to that as someone who'd been fasting for 40 days he was hungry yeah. and i don't think that need to eat bread was sinful that's just a natural need for it 
but he chose to put that temptation and say, no, that's not, I'm not, can't act on this, because that's not honoring to God, even just making bread. So when, when, I, when we look at sexual attraction, same-sex sexual attraction, what I do in my brain, my, my head, when I see someone who I'm attracted to is male, the first thought I need to put aside is that, you know, these are not healthy attractions. But the second thing I think about, and this could be helpful for your, your audience as well, is, is there something in that, re, that reaction that's, that is natural, that is something that is a good thing? And, and I, if it's not, then I shouldn't think of it that way. But, but then I'm reminded again, and I, I shared this already in terms of what, what's going on in someone's brain, that what I long for in that person is a sense of masculine that I don't see in myself. And so that part, that need to, set, to, to be or to embrace masculinity, that's the good thing. And, and what I need to do, and, and that's what I, how I process this, is to say, you know, all those are things I find attractive in that person. I don't need to do that because I don't need to find that masculine identity in him. I can find that in God's design for me. Right. If we look at the Christian story, Chris, and this is what's so important about the, the Christian message, uh, both male and female are made in the image of God. And that's actually quite rare in religious uh, terms. Uh, I've looked it up and a lot of creation stories have women as an afterthought. So in one in Aboriginal um, creation myth, God makes two men and then turns one into a woman. Uh, in, in other creation myths, they have men and women coming from two different trees or two different kinds of plants. So they're different organisms. In an ancient Korean religion, God actually makes man in his image and then takes a bear and turns her into a woman. So women come from bears in this Korean religion. The Christian story says masculine and feminine are defined by the, their identity with each other, the relationship with each other, and the relationship with God. And, and so when, when I'm talking this way, I'm not trying to justify same-sex sexuality or even attraction. What I'm saying is in, in terms of being culpable, morally, sinfully culpable, uh, there's a difference between uh, struggling with, um, with a, a reaction that's been corrupted in ourselves and, and being willful in our lust or willful in our thoughts, right? Absolutely. So like I, I said, when, when you have Jesus being attracted to, to wanting to eat bread, that's just a natural reaction to that. And so you're right, we're, I'm still trying, to, I think most of us are still trying to parse through what part's sinful and one part's not in terms of what are we morally culpable for. But, and, but at the same time, I think it's helpful for your audience to know that these um, distinctions can take place because the culture is asking us about that. Yeah. Are you saying I as a gay man, this is what they're saying, right? I as a lesbian or I as a, a gay man, I'm, I'm going to hell, I'm going to, sit, to go to, to uh, be rejected by God because I have attractions I can't control. And that's the question I'm trying to address. Yeah. And as the church, these kinds of definitions will help us understand that. What the person's doing if they make sexuality their identity is idolatry. I think that's very clear. But if you have someone in your congregation who's struggling with these attractions, helping them label them this way to know what's sinful and what's not will actually help them deal with it much better. Well, I do think that there is that real challenge of, of that constant guilt. So I have these feelings. Uh, now I'm guilty, guilty, guilty. And those feelings don't go away. Right, and you don't get to act on those feelings, mm. so I can I can appreciate the struggle that that would be that that's that if if we define the glance, if you will, that initial attraction as sin, and then we're constantly sinning. You're always you're living with that always before you, and you have always this guilt, mm. and you know from and and it's and it's too cavalier or too easy for me because i have the privilege of being married and getting to fulfill my sexual desires with my wife in a intimate and in a beautiful relationship our, our original our sinful nature needs christ absolutely right and also our our actual sin so where we fall right so yeah. for me as i understand it my glance at that beautiful woman I, and initially thinking it, not a lust, but a sexual thought, a sexual, wow, she's attractive. Mm -hmm. 
we, I think that still needs Christ's blood and I need the Holy Spirit to sanctify my thoughts so that next time I see that woman, it's not initially as an attractive being, but actually as a sister in Christ to love in that way. Um, so I, I personally think that that first glance that had that sexual attraction thing, I need to ask God to forgive me that that initial thought, help me, Lord, sanctify me with your spirit uh, and help me not, indeed, not to act further upon it, right? Mm. But at the same time, um, our, our sinfulness, hey, that, that always clings to us. And, and that's why I think right. that element of grace needs to be so prevalent, right? And, and it should not be, and, and that's why I don't want to flog this, this point too hard as if, well, that glass is sin and therefore, you know, right. It's all of us have sin and temptation and covetous thoughts and, and, and struggle. And all those things need the redemption of Christ. And then that morally culpable Absolutely. piece that you, 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 you rightly point out, all of that also needs the redemption of Christ. I'm morally culpable for, for my thoughts, for my inclinations, from beginning to end, and thanks be to God, eh, that Christ has made full mm -hmm. payment for all those sins, because otherwise, indeed, Absolutely. you and I, neither one of us could stand. Mm -hmm. right? So we have so much to be thankful for, eh, in God's grace. Absolutely. So that, and that's why we believe in grace as, as the church, and we should offer it. Yes. Right? And, and that, I appreciate your comments there, because it is, uh, it is something that a lot of us in the church haven't thought of.